Ah, the holiday season. That short sliver of winter that warms the heart before it becomes painfully depressing for three months straight. I'm gonna be honest with you guys. Growing up as a kid, my family didn't really celebrate Christmas. Because of that, I probably haven't seen most of the Christmas movies that people say are staples of the season. But there was always one movie that my family watched every year, no matter what. And that's Home Alone. Home Alone is one of those franchises that's so popular that it really doesn't need an introduction from me. It'd be like me doing an intro for Spider-Man or Michael Jackson or something. And we all know that the only people dumb enough to claim that they've never heard of those those guys are desperate reaction channels trying to get views. The first Home Alone was so successful that it grossed over $450 million in the box office. It spurred five sequels so far, a handful of terrible games. And back in the day, it even had its own line of action figures and kids toys. Wait, hold on a sec. Is that the talk boy from Home Alone 2? That thing's real? That is so cool. So yeah, it was a bit of a cultural phenomenon when it came out. Now, everybody knows that the Home Alone movies with Macaulay Culkin are the best ones. But after that, things get worse. So why on God's earth am I subjecting myself to the crappy sequels and reviewing all of the Home Alone movies today? Well, I'm pleased to announce that this year, I'm officially a Christmas celebrator. Thanks to my wonderful girlfriend, I am now part of a Christmas celebrating family. I got my advent calendar, my Christmas sweater, and I thought what better way to show off my newfound Christmas spirit than to subject myself to some of the worst Christmas movie sequels ever made. That and I saw the new video from Cosmonaut Variety Hour where he reviewed all of the Batman movies and I thought, that seems like a pretty fun format to steal. So buckle in, buckle up, and come celebrate Christmas with me by watching this beloved franchise get beaten into the ground by money hungry execs and kids with punchable faces. There's honestly not a lot for me to say about this first Home Alone movie that hasn't been said a million times before, so I'm gonna keep this short and sweet, but goddamn, what a perfect Christmas movie. Now these days, I feel like Home Alone is mostly known for the booby traps and the slapstick comedy, but the thing that immediately jumps out at me is how perfectly they portray the family and what it's like to be a kid. Mom, Uncle Frank won't let me watch the movie, but the big kids can. Why can't I? Kevin, I'm on the phone. And that's mostly because of John Hughes. He's always had this legendary ability to capture the essence of being young in his movies, and this script is no exception. But John Hughes doesn't get all the credit because the way his script is brought to life by the directing of Chris Columbus is what takes it to an entirely new level. The opening 10 minutes of this movie is masterful. Not a single second is wasted. It's a whirlwind sequence of events where every beat along the way tells you something about the characters or the world that they're setting up. It starts with the house in complete chaos, and Harry, who's dressed as a cop, is being ignored. There is literally no sense of order here. Then in just a few lines, we learn that Kevin is a bright kid that's being excluded by the rest of the family, and his parents are too busy to be sympathetic. Even the camera work speaks to Kevin's exclusion when the camera follows his older siblings and he gets left behind. Meanwhile, we keep cutting back to Harry trying to reach the adults, which emphasizes how they're not just unattentive towards Kevin, but that they're unattentive in general. But back upstairs in Buzz's room, we learn about the neighbor and how he's potentially a serial killer, which sets up the end of the second and third acts of the movie. And then we have my favorite part of all, the pizza scene. After Buzz pushes Kevin too far by eating all of his pizza, Kevin finally pushes back, literally. <laughs> it's so well choreographed, it's just... Mm. Chef's kiss. And of course, to wrap it all up, we learn that Harry isn't actually a cop, which tells us that not only is he a threat, but that he'll be lingering in the background amidst all the chaos for the rest of the movie. It's just so good. And the unsung hero here is, of course, John Williams, who perfectly scores the movie. But man, is it just me or is this family full of assholes? Kevin is eight years old and just wants help packing his bag, but nobody wants to be even remotely nice to him. And then when Buzz purposely eats all of the cheese pizza, the only kind that Kevin likes, and he actually stands up for himself just a little, they all collectively turn on him. Look on what you, you did, you little jerk. Kevin, get upstairs right now. Bro, half that mess had nothing to do with Kevin. And if that's not bad enough, his mom sends him to the attic without dinner and just makes him starve for the rest of the night. Just stay up there. I don't want to see you again for the rest of the night. What a... Bitch. Now the real heart of this movie is, of course, about the things that Kevin learns when he's left at home alone. He learns the true value of family and not being too judgmental. He learns to be self-reliant, which everybody didn't think he was capable of doing. He learns to set up booby traps to a montage that is way too f***ing loud. <laughs> 
Seriously, who mixed this thing? Why the f is this one scene so much louder than every other part of the movie? Swear, I did not alter the audio there at all. That is actually just how it sounds. Anyway, speaking of booby traps, I gotta make a confession. I'm not really that big a fan of slapstick. Like, I don't hate it, but usually it just feels too obvious and cheap for me to get a solid laugh out of it. Unless it's done right. For me, good slapstick has to be one part funny situations and then one part good comedy acting. And I can't lie, this movie has both. Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern f kill it, especially Daniel Stern as Marv. The man just makes the best noises and facial expressions ever. And Joe Pesci doing the Muttley from Wacky Races is also such a great touch to the character. <laughs> what I like about the traps in this movie is that while they are wacky, they feel decently grounded in reality compared to the sequels. Like the most elaborate traps you see here are the heated doorknob, the falling iron, the flamethrower thing. It's out there, but it feels believable that a kid could come up with this stuff. In fact, it almost feels Bart Simpson-esque, which is something I'd say about Kevin McAllister in general. He has this similar rebellious quality to him, and they're both geniuses when it comes to causing mischief. While Kevin is off dealing with the wet bandits, the rest of the movie follows his mom desperately trying to make it back home as fast as possible. And I really like this part of the movie. It's a nice touch that evens out the pacing of the film, and it also helps the ending, where the family reunites with Kevin, feel more rewarding. Overall, it's a highly entertaining movie, well acted, very tightly written. I'm gonna give this one 8.5 out of 10. Now when I was a kid, I remember that I liked Home Alone 2 more than the first movie. I don't know what my reasoning was back then, but it was always the one I wanted to watch the most. But today, I can definitely say that it's not as good as the original. Home Alone 2 suffers from a pretty noticeable case of sequelitis. Everything has to be bigger and better than the first movie. Last time Kevin was left alone in the suburbs, this time he's left alone in New York City. Last time he had crazy booby traps, this time he has even crazier booby traps. Last time Kevin was 8 years old, this time he's 10. That's just going too far. Honestly, even though this movie isn't as good as the original, it's still very solid. And that's probably because it's almost the exact same movie. It follows the exact same pattern, pretty much beat for beat, right up until the ending credits. It even has a quick scene where the family is watching TV in a different language, even though they're in Miami and there's no reason that they can't just watch something in English. Now the downside to everything being almost exactly the same as the first movie is that it feels like nobody has learned anything since last time. Kevin's family is still full of assholes. He gets in trouble for pushing Buzz again. His mom makes no effort to be understanding and sends him to the attic again. You know, Kevin, last time we all tried to take a trip, we had a problem that started just like this. Yeah, with me getting crapped on. I don't care for your choice of words. That's not what happened last time. Yes, it is. That's not what's happening this time. Yes, it is. Kevin even makes the exact same wish again. Well, you got your wish last year. Maybe you'll get it again this year. I hope so. Even later in the movie, when he meets that weird bird lady, he judges her in the exact same way that he judged his neighbor in the first movie. I'm telling you, nobody has learned anything in this movie. And the lack of learning from their mistakes makes it a lot harder to feel sympathy for any of the characters when you watch these movies back to back. I think that's a big part of why I felt way less invested in the mom storyline in this movie than I did in the original. Because the first time around, it feels like she just made an honest mistake and that she's not actually that unattentive. But the second time around, I'm not as willing to give her the benefit of the doubt. But let's be honest, for most people, the big appeal of the movie is isn't gonna be any of that crap. It's gonna be watching Kevin defeat the bandits with his clever booby traps. And I can't lie, this movie delivers on the booby traps once again. We get another montage of Kevin setting up the traps that's way too f***ing loud. Seriously, even the sound mixing guy has learned nothing. I'm telling you, nobody learns anything in this movie. This time around, they don't even try to make the traps feel grounded or realistic. They just went full on Looney Tunes with it. Like Marv should have been dead at least five times over by the end of this film with the amount of abuse he takes.
Anyways, Home Alone 2 is just a giant rehash of the first movie, but the first movie is so good and the packaging is still so charming that it ends up being a solid movie anyways. So I think I'm gonna go with a 7.5 out of 10 for this one. Now in the Cosmonaut video that I stole this format from, he did a Batman tier list thing where he would rank each Batman at the end of their respective films. So I'm gonna do the same thing, but with the moms. Now you might be asking, why rate the mom, not the kids? And come on, we already know how that rating is gonna go. Macaulay Culkin is great, everyone else is worse. It's too predictable. This is more fun. The requirements are simple. The mom has to be nice to the main kid before sh goes down. The nicer and more understanding they are, the higher they're ranked. And they also have to prove that they care about their kid later in the movie. Now Kevin's mom is a mixed bag. She takes her kid for granted, doesn't even try to understand his point of view, and is a repeat offender on all accounts. But on the positive side, she puts herself through hell to get back to him in the first movie. And at the end of Home Alone 2, she knew where to find Kevin, which shows that she does pay attention to him even if it's mostly off screen. So based on all of that, I'm gonna put her in the B tier. Well, we're past the classics now. It's only gonna be downhill from here. Home Alone 3 is the first film in the franchise to not star Macaulay Culkin or the McAllister family. Instead, the movie focuses on the Pruitt family and their youngest son, Alex. This is the point in the franchise where the films really start to jump off the rails. Instead of your usually accidentally left behind plot, in this movie, Alex is home alone because he gets the chicken pox and his parents are away at work. And instead of two bandits looking to make a quick buck, it's an international team of high tech criminals that accidentally misplace a stolen government chip, which ends up in a toy car that gets gifted to Alex. Yeah, this movie is pretty wacky. Chris Columbus does not come back to direct this one, but it is still written by John Hughes. And let me tell you, that really goes a long way to carry this thing. Because honestly, I think it still has a lot of the fun dialogue and whimsical character of the first two films. But unlike those movies, which feature some swearing and darker imagery, Home Alone 3 feels much more childish in tone. It's extra silly and extra cute. We got animal friends now, like this rat that Alex talks to, and this bird that's like the coolest bird of all time. <laughs> Now with the criminals, they actually go to great lengths to establish that they're pretty competent this time around. They can break into anything, reroute phone lines, ID taxis from far away, vanish at a moment's notice. This ain't Harry and Marv anymore. These guys are the real deal. But what they couldn't prepare for was an eight year old boy named Alex. Look, I don't necessarily have an issue with the fact that this movie is so much more unrealistic than the last two, but I definitely prefer the more grounded tone of the original Home Alone movie. Having said that, this movie actually does a pretty great job of not being being a rehash of the previous films. There's no montage of Alex doing crazy fun things when he's home alone. There's no weird old person that he misjudges. If anything, it's the other way around this time. He doesn't commit any crimes to make the police inaccessible to him. There's no super loud setting up traps montage. Thank God. And it doesn't take place during Christmas. Wait, this isn't a Christmas movie? What the f- Also, Alex is really nothing like Kevin McAllister at all. Sure, they're both incredibly mature for their age and both are clearly super bright. What do I do if there's a tornado? They don't happen in winter. Social unrest? I don't think so. Boredom? I hear it's deadly in old folks. But Alex doesn't have a mischievous bone in his body. He's like the sweetest kid ever. If anything, he's too perfect. Who is this kid, North? North's room is always clean. North always looks both ways. North never spoils his appetite. North flosses. Actually, to be fair, he does pull a pretty Bart Simpson-y prank with his TV remote telescope thing. Maybe Alex does have some edge after all, but not as much as Kevin. Now, unlike the McAllisters, Alex only has two siblings, his brother Stan and his sister Molly, who's played by Scarlett Johansson. And they pick on him for being the youngest, but it's much more toned down in this movie. I wouldn't say they're being assholes about it. It's more like light teasing. Unfortunately, John Williams doesn't return as the composer for this movie, but Nick Glennie Smith does a pretty decent job in his place. I wouldn't say the score is iconic, but it's well suited to the film. And there's this one part where the piano goes hard as f You can tell that they really tried to live up to the previous movies here, and that it was still a big deal to make a Home Alone sequel in 1997. This time around, the family plays a little larger of a role in the film because they're actually around the whole time. And I'm happy to say that for the first time in this entire franchise, his mom is actually understanding. Wow, it took three films, but we finally have a mom that isn't awful in the beginning of the movie. No wonder Alex isn't as edgy as Kevin. He doesn't have to constantly call out his family on their bullshit. And this mom isn't just nice, she's also kind of based as hell. And Charlie, I just want you to know that you're putting me in the position of having to choose between making a house payment and taking care of my sick child, and I really don't appreciate it. 
One thing that this Home Alone does better than the previous two films is that it gets a lot more creative with its action. There's a really cool sequence about halfway through the movie where Alex sticks a camera onto his new remote car to prove that the criminals are in his neighborhood. But when they spot the car, they start chasing it because it has the chip that they're looking for inside. It's a really fun part of the movie. And the same goes for the booby traps. They're more intricate than ever. Like seriously, this kid is a f***ing genius. For one of his traps, he does some 4D chess type shit that's like three moves ahead of the professional team of international criminals. Let me point something out to you. Stands clear. There's a lot of good set pieces in this one. The false bottom trampoline into a freezing swimming pool, the giant wheeled buckets of glue that turned into oversized roller skates, the double electrocution setup. <laughs> probably put these traps on par with Home Alone 2, but where they lose points is in the delivery. Like I said before, these criminals are no Harry and Marv, which also means that they're not as funny when they get hurt. I mean, the actors are fine, but they just don't do as good a job as Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern. Also, am I crazy, or does the criminal girl in this scene suddenly have a Russian accent for like two seconds? I'm certain Bradley just misplaced his toy car. Little boys do have wild imaginations. This time around, when the movie ends, the kid actually gets some recognition for his hard work. And I like that. It's about time these genius kids got a little respect from the adults. There's also a reuniting scene with his mom, which plays out kind of like the old films, but without that John Williams soundtrack, it just doesn't hit the same. The movie ends with the whole family getting together for a wholesome dinner. There's a Herbert Hoover reference because that was also in Home Alone 2. I had the chicken pox when Herbert Hoover was in the White House. You know, Herbert Hoover once stayed here on this floor. Vacuum guy? And it goes out on a happy note with some classic late 90s third eye blind sounding song. Overall, considering that this is the first Home Alone sequel to not star Macaulay Culkin, I'd say it's a pretty alright movie. I'm thinking a solid 6.5 or maybe even 7 out of 10. Also fun fact, Roger Ebert thought that this was better than the first two Home Alone movies for some reason. Now for the mom tier list, ooh baby, you know that she ain't no B tier mom. She actually gives a shit about her son before anything bad happens. She actually tries to be understanding towards him and actively does her best to avoid leaving him home alone. Jesus, it's sad that that's all it takes to do better than the first mom. Is she perfect? No, she isn't willing to believe Alex when he says that he saw burglars in the neighbor's home, but that's pretty reasonable, I think. I probably wouldn't believe an eight-year-old who said that either. So I'm gonna say that Alex's mom is A tier. All right, guys, we're venturing into unknown territory now. The first three I'd seen as a kid a bunch of times, but this, I don't even know what to expect from Home Alone 4. Unlike the last three, this one's a made for TV movie, so it probably won't have the budget like the last three had. For that reason, I won't go too hard on the acting or the music or even the set pieces or anything like that, because I don't think it'd be fair. But like, just look at this kid. Is that a face you can watch for two hours? All right, it, man, let's pop it in. Jesus, even the title screen is severely nerfed. So this time we're back with the McAllisters. They don't really feel anything like the original family, but I guess that's to be expected. The plot here is that Kevin's parents have split up and are getting a divorce, and Kevin's dad is now seeing some new rich woman named Natalie that he wants to marry. It's Christmas time again, which is a point it gets over Home Alone 3, and the dad wants the kids to spend Christmas with him this year and his new girlfriend. But only Kevin ends up going. While there, he encounters his old friend Marv, now played by French Stewart, who is trying to kidnap a prince that will be staying at Natalie's house for Christmas. Yes, this movie is is about Kevin stopping Marv from kidnapping a prince. God help us all. Okay, wh where do I even start here? First of all, we're back to the family being super shitty again. Like, check out this scene where the dad asks the kids to stay with him for Christmas. What do you say? I think I'm gonna pass. Did the mom just guilt Kevin into staying with her? Like, what the f was that? After the kids say no and the dad leaves, Buzz gets stuck at home babysitting Kevin and decides to make him miserable for it. I'm not gonna criticize the music. I'm not gonna criticize the music. 
So Buzz acts like a jerk and tortures Kevin until their mom gets back home. And when she gets back, Kevin tries to tell her about it, but she doesn't really get it and tells him to go to his room after he once again wishes he was an only child. So basically we're just fully back to rehashing now. This inspires Kevin to take a bus to Natalie's house and that's where the movie really begins. We get some scenes of her showing off her cool smart house where everything is voice activated by a remote control. And then we meet Marv. Nice house, huh, Pumpkin? Sure is, Marv. We're gonna wait for the royals to arrive. Oh, do 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 and then we're gonna kidnap the prince. <laughs> oh, don't kidnap me, I'm fancy. <sighs> Did they even watch the original Home Alone movies? Cause this guy is nothing like Marv. I mean, it's cool if you wanna have different bandits this time around, but if you're gonna go with an established character, at least try to make him similar to the original. The weird thing is that this version of Marv actually acts more like Harry. He dresses like Harry, he talks like Harry, he even blames Harry for screwing up the previous plans in the exact way that Harry would blame Marv. Look where Harry's plans kept landing me, huh? In jail, well, not this time. So Marv and this new girl, Vera, sneak into the house using one of the all access remotes and run into Kevin who attacks them with, are you ready for this? The shower. Only it's not a regular shower. For some reason, it's a super crazy high powered shower that literally sends Marv to the ground. Kevin tries to warn the butler about the invasion, but he's totally MIA, so he ends up flooding the house instead, which pisses off Natalie, but then she just forgives him a few hours later, and somehow the house is also completely fixed and not damaged. Then, this happens. Not gonna do it. I'm not gonna criticize the music or the dancing. After decorating the tree, Kevin and his dad have a heart to heart where he makes some dumb analogy about sports cars and loneliness. And then we flash to the rest of the family for the first time since Kevin left. And at first they play it off like they miss Kevin, but then they say this. I always hold him up. And then I give him a wedgie. <laughs> he makes a fuss, we all laugh. Bruh, not only does this mom not give a f that Buzz bullied Kevin, she fondly reminisces about it when he's not home. What the f is this movie? Uh, I miss torturing Kevin. Yeah, me too. Back at the mansion, Natalie is throwing a party in honor of the prince that will be coming to stay with them, who by the way is late, but that's not really important. It's a big fancy party with a bunch of waiters catering it. And one of those waiters is Marv in disguise, using the party as an opportunity to sneak into the house. Except for some reason, he's wearing the waiter outfit over his trench coat. This movie is so f stupid dude. Kevin tries to catch Marv and Vera, but fails again and really pisses off Natalie in the process. So this time he decides to set up some booby traps for when Marv inevitably comes back. We see like three traps get set up and they're not particularly inspiring either. He f***s with the house elevator, puts some pots on a string, doctors some audio that he recorded of Marv to make it sound like he's being mean to Vera. And then the next day, Marv and Vera are ready to strike again. Now throughout the movie, it keeps trying to hint to us that the butler is working with Marv and that's why Marv has one of those smart remotes to unlock the doors in the house. Plus, Marv constantly mentions that he has an inside man. So Kevin, who's on to the butler, manages to trick him and lock him in the basement. And also, by the way, I'm just now realizing that this butler is the guy from Mr. Deeds. Oh, he am I sitting in a tin cup? Anyways, that's when we find out that the butler was actually a good guy the whole time, and that the real inside man was the maid, who was also Marv's mom. It would be dear except for one thing. Prescott is not their accomplice. I am. Hey, mom. But in the end, she just ends up locking him in the basement with the butler. And this leads to one of the stupidest scenes in the whole movie. Kevin and the butler have a cell phone, and they have like five opportunities to call the cops, but they don't even try to. Instead, Kevin calls Buzz twice, and then the battery dies. But luckily, there's a dumb waiter in the basement, which is probably because Home Alone 3 had a dumb waiter, and Kevin uses it to escape. And that's when he finally gets to use his shitty traps to stop the bad guys. Over here! When the mom sees that Kevin is attacking Marv and Vera, she decides to go full Conker's Bad Fur Day on his ass and chases him with a frying pan. In the span of like seven minutes, Kevin quickly defeats the bad guys with the help of the butler, the cops come and arrest the crooks, the dad decides to get back together with the mom, and Natalie is heartbroken while everybody laughs at her. The end. No, seriously, that's actually how it ends. So yeah, that, that was painful to watch. Like I had the stomach flu last week and it was just constant diarrhea, and that was more enjoyable than this movie. Why the f does this movie exist? If you're gonna make a movie this bad, then why even make it? I'm gonna give this thing a 
one out of 10, and that's being generous. Now for the mom ranking, I think we can all agree that this is by far the worst mom we've seen in any of these movies so far. It's bad enough that she barely has sympathy for Kevin, but she actively laughs about his misery too. There is a nice scene in there that I didn't mention where they share a sweet phone call talking about a wonderful life, but it doesn't do sh to redeem her. I'm putting her in the D tier. You know, I thought this would be a fun video idea when we started, but now that we're four movies down, I think I'm starting to lose my sanity. Please remind me not to do something like this ever again. But we've come so far, so let's just do it. Let's get it over with. Home Alone 5 Holiday Heist. Title card is butchered again, only now they're also doing a weird copyright free version of the Home Alone music too. <laughs> So this time around, we're ditching the McAllisters again, and we're following a new family that just moved into a brand new home. The plot here is basically that the main kid, who's an unbearably nerdy gamer... Yes! I cleared level 17! Hey, Finn, press pause for a bit, why don't you, kiddo? But this is a mega boss battle! ...believes that the house is haunted because his neighbor told him so. Meanwhile, a group of art thieves want to break in and steal a painting that's locked away in a secret room in the basement. Also, they're afraid of the ghosts, too. I don't want to upset some ghost gangster. There aren't actually any ghosts, though, thank God, but both groups think that there are, and they keep accidentally tricking each other into believing it's real. Alright, it's just a branch. Just a branch. <sighs> the bandits in this one are just as goofy as the last movie. You got a lockpick guy that's really bad at being discreet, a thief girl that spends the whole time obsessing over her ex-boyfriend, and Malcolm McDowell. Why did you just shut up? Finn, the main kid, is scared of the basement in this movie, just like Kevin was in Home Alone 1. But instead of it being because of a furnace looking scary, it's because he thinks ghosts live there. The basement level in Dragons and Warriors is a prison filled with ghosts. Now one thing I'll say about this movie is that the production quality is definitely a little bit higher than the last one. Not by much, but like the color grading and camera work feels a lot better this time around. Music is still terrible though. And I don't even know what to say about this game that they always show Finn playing. Take that, Overkill! <laughs> now, in the last movie, Marvin Vera seemed really dumb, but everyone else was at least mostly normal. In this movie, everybody is stupid. The dad is stupid. Get out of my room! <laughs> the mom is stupid. Why don't you just go without me? This is not a root canal or something. The neighbor kid is basically Bubba from Forrest Gump, but instead of liking shrimp, he likes snow. Build snowman, make snowballs, go snow sledding, design snow forts, go snow skiing, make snow angels, start a snow avalanche, wear snowshoes. Shrimp kebabs, shrimp creole, shrimp soup. Trump the whole deal in this movie is that the parents go to a work Christmas party that the mom's new boss is throwing, which leaves Finn and his sister Alexis home alone. Finn accidentally discovers that art thieves are trying to steal something from his house, so he consults his Xbox Live friend that's like 15 years older than him for help on how to defeat them. And that's where the booby traps come in. Now Finn pretty much accomplishes almost everything here with the roll of yarn and the objects in his house. It's nothing to write home about, but at least this time we have a proper bandits versus booby trap scenario. And one thing I'll give them credit for is that they combine the booby traps with the the ghost story in a pretty decent way. The art thieves think that all the crazy stuff happening to them is paranormal instead of it just being a kid f***ing with them. But unfortunately, the traps are really lame this time around. Like remember how in the first Home Alone movies there'd be a big heavy object that falls on them from above? Oops. <laughs> well, Finn does something similar to that, only instead of hitting them in the head, he hits them in the shins. <laughs> Ouchie. He also creates this trap that can be easily defeated just by walking left or right, but the guy just stands there and takes it for some reason. When the bandits finally make it into the house, Finn poisons one of them and feeds him glue. <laughs> Sorry. Finn poisons one of them and feeds him glue, which is honestly just super f up in Jesus Christ. He also somehow engineered the sink to release fluff instead of water, which causes the bandit guy to sort of look like Santa Claus after he spits out the glue. I guess that's supposed to be like a callback to Harry and the feathers from the first movie or something. I'm not gonna lie, this one got me laughing. Good job, guys. Meanwhile, back at the Christmas party, his parents get stuck because of a snowstorm, and this for some reason prompts the mother to flip out at her boss. I I'm sorry, sir, but this is more important than my job, and if you want to fire me, then... Go ahead. I don't know why she would say this. Leaving a Christmas party early has never been grounds for firing somebody. But eventually the roads get cleared and they start to make their way home. It's at this point that Finn's Xbox Live friend calls the mom and tries to explain to them that her son is in danger. 
Hi, my name is Simon Hassler, and your daughter is locked in the basement. You kidnapped my kids? What? The scene is also pretty funny, though I don't know why the mom would ever hang up on the person she believes has kidnapped her kids, but whatever. This, of course, prompts the mom to call the SWAT on him, but then they just end up watching the burglary happen live on camera. I don't even know, man. This is melting my brain at this point. These Home Alone movies are just killing me. The kids defeat the art thieves through the power of yarn, and then the parents make it home just in time to see the cops arresting the bad guys. And when the cops arrive, Finn says, The bad guys trapped in the basement. But don't worry. It's not too scary down there. Which I think is supposed to be similar to how Kevin proves his self-reliance at the end of the first movie and gets respect from Buzz. Except here it just comes off as a super weird thing to say to a police officer. And that's the end of the movie. Utter trash, but slightly less trash than the last one. I'm gonna give it a 1.5 out of 10. Would never watch again. Now for the mom's tier list, I'm a bit torn here. In this movie, the mom doesn't believe Finn, but that's also because he thinks the house is haunted, which is pretty stupid anyways. And she also doesn't really single him out at any point in the movie. She treats both her kids equally, which at least earns her some points. Maybe this is a controversial take here, but I'm gonna put her in the B tier. So we're finally back to making films with a budget again for this last sequel, Home Sweet Home Alone. Now, I remember seeing trailers for this one a few years back and thinking that it looked like a terrible idea, but I think these last two movies might have been some kind of psychological torture or something, because after forcing myself to watch that crap, this movie suddenly doesn't seem so bad. We're now officially in requel territory, which means that they have to make the obligatory self-aware joke that every remake does. Oh, this is garbage. I don't know why they're always trying to remake the classics. Never as good as the originals. This movie takes place in the original Home Alone universe, complete with a cameo from Buzz, but it's an entirely unique story. The plot here is that a young couple named Pam and Jeff are secretly putting their house on the market because they can no longer afford to live there, and they're doing it in secret because they just can't bring themselves to tell their kids that they're gonna have to be moving. It starts with them hosting an open house for potential buyers, and among those buyers is a British woman named Carol and her incredibly puntable son, Max. Yes, I said puntable, as in Ike from South Park. <laughs> Max and Jeff briefly meet while Jeff is putting away some old dolls in a box, but it's a short-lived meeting because Max and his mom Carol need to get back home to prepare for their trip to Tokyo the next day. As I'm sure you've already guessed, Max is this movie's Kevin McAllister. He's staying at a house full of relatives, nobody has time to pay attention to him, he falls asleep in a car instead of an attic, and then he gets left behind when the family goes to Tokyo, blah blah blah. As all of that is happening, Jeff finds out that one of the dolls in that box is worth $200,000 due to a manufacturing error, which would give him and Pam enough money to be able to afford keeping the house. The only problem is, it's missing. Do you see where this is going? Suspecting that Max stole it, Pam and Jeff decide to break into his house and steal it back. It's a role reversal of the original Home Alone film. This time the bandits are the good guys and the Home Alone kid is the bad guy. Of course they could have just asked for the doll back, but you know, whatever, I'm not gonna harp on that too much. Now I'm gonna give the writers some credit here. This is a pretty unique twist on the Home Alone format and I respect them for changing it up. But the problem is that because Pam and Jeff are the main characters and you sympathize with them the most, the whole concept of booby traps versus bandits just doesn't feel right here. In the best Home Alone movies, the bandits taking abuse is funny because they're bad guys and they deserve it. It's a black and white approach, but it works. In this movie, you just feel bad for the poor couple because all they want to do is write by their family, but some asshole kid stole $200,000 to them and is now literally torturing them too. It makes for a very bizarre spin on the Home Alone formula. We get the classic, I have the house to myself montage, but because the kid is basically the villain, it doesn't feel very satisfying. The booby traps are all right. Some of them are a bit too far-fetched, like the idea that anyone could aim Coke and Mentos bottles at someone with any degree of success. But for the most part, I'd say that we're talking about fairly standard stuff here. Slippery stairs, freezing water, and so on. The writing is very Disney in this movie, which basically means that it's corny as f Though to be fair, there are a few jokes here that actually landed for me. Like when Jeff is trying to break into Max's house for the first time, he doesn't want Pam to know what he's doing. So when she texts him, he just says that he's out getting milk. But then she looks back at the fridge and there's like 20 cartons of milk in there. That's good. I like that. And there are a few funny gags like that sprinkled throughout the film. In fact, even though it's super corny, I'd say that the writing here is literally miles above the last two movies. It's just obviously directed towards a very young audience. But I think what really holds this movie back is the fact that it's tied to the Home Alone franchise. Like honestly, everything here would play out a lot better if they weren't trying to cram in a Kevin McAllister story with Max. Like take the ending when he reunites with his mom, for example. Because Pam and Jeff are the real protagonists here and getting back the doll is the main storyline, it feels completely unearned and pointless when 
Max finally reunites with his mom. He's not the main character, we don't care about him, we're not emotionally invested in him. If they had just doubled down on him being a bad guy and dedicated more time to crafting a deeper story around Pam and Jeff, or their kids, I think this movie would have been a lot better. But other than that, what can I say? It's a mediocre film at best, but it's leagues above the fourth and fifth movies. I'd rather watch this than have diarrhea any day. So with that, I think I'm gonna go with a 3.5 out of 10 on this one. Also, I'm just reading some of the user reviews on IMDb right now, and these bitches don't know what pain is. This is pain. As for the mom's tier list, I don't even know what to rank her here, to be honest. She's barely in the movie at all. Like, there isn't really enough to go on here to do a proper ranking of her. I guess I should have watched all of the movies before I decided to do a mom's tier list. Ah, what are you gonna do? I'm just gonna throw her in the C tier and call it a day. Well, we did it, guys. We watched every Home Alone movie for some reason. Why did I do this again? Oh yeah, it's Christmas. Man, I should've spent a lot of time talking shit about families for a Christmas special. Rewatching the first three Home Alone movies was an absolute joy. But watching the last three might've caused permanent damage to my brain. Please don't ever let me do this again. The difference between the original and the later sequels is honestly pretty mind-blowing. By the sixth movie, it almost makes you forget how great the start of the franchise really was. But no matter how bad the sequels get, nothing will ever erase the genius of the first two films and the perfect storm that went into making them. Anyways, it's nearly the 25th now and I have my first ever Christmas to celebrate, so I gotta get going. But before I do, I just want to say thanks for watching and Merry Christmas.